We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Welcome to Grok Talk. Brought to you by the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers and the bloggers at GraniteRock.com. It is Saturday, January 17th, 2015, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'd like to welcome you to the program, let you know who's going to be on the show today. Uh, Ed Nail from the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers will be here to talk to us about voter fraud. Max Abramson is supposed to come in and give us a little update on uh, a justice segment in New Hampshire. Ken Iring from the Wyndham School Board will be in to talk about the interesting little debacle that's going on around there debacle for those of you. I'm not turning you on yet because I'm not done talking and you'll interrupt me. And Dr. Fodeman, Dr. Jason Fodeman, MD. Uh, he is a Doc Squats member and has uh, contributed a large quantity of, of information on uh, heritage.org about health care and Obamacare and all kinds of fun stuff like that. And he's going to come in and talk to us uh, about patient-centered outcomes research. And uh, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, doctors may be forced to treat the average patient based on government-created protocols instead of treating their own individual patients with that whole doctor-patient relation thing, relationship facade that we've been led to believe we're entitled to. And uh, your mic's on. You can talk now. Go ahead. Debacle. 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 Potato, potato. Fidelia onions. <laughs> Fidelia. Fidelia. You can't mess that one up. It's pronounced Gordon. <laughs> Okay. I love that commercial. That's an awesome commercial. I love anyway, uh, welcome to Grog Talk. We uh, we uh, would have had Guy on, and we had planned to have him on, but he had an issue at the farm today. Couldn't be with us, so we're just going to kind of do what we do for a few minutes, and, and hopefully Max shows up. Or yeah, He's supposed to be in Concord today, so he said he'd drop in. You know, but that, if he doesn't, we have plenty of things to talk about. I want to point out, Guy is one of our citizen legislators. Because, you know, he's, he's got real work to do. He owns his own business. He is yes. a farmer yeah. and tries to balance that out by serve, doing the real public service, at least here in New Hampshire. A hundred bucks a year, it's public service. I have to say that when I, he said he was going to come in every week, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. We do that. <laughs> Who else is crazy enough to do that every single week? <laughs> but we, uh, we, we, as always, have a, a complex discussion with a lot of details. <clears throat> about what the Whiskey Tango Foxtrot of the week is going to be, and we have a lot of potentials. Uh, this is the one that I picked. Turning out of breaking news on a protest that shut down Interstate 93 in both directions close to Boston this morning. Mass State Police tell us they arrested 29 people from this highway protest. People chained themselves to barrels that were filled with concrete. Protesters say they're part of a group called Black Lives Matter and say that they wanted to, quote, confront white complacency in the oppression of black people in Boston. At a news conference a few minutes ago, state police said that it was a serious risk to public safety. All right, so here's what happened. These lunatics put concrete barrels across the middle of a, how many lanes is I-93 there? Five, four, six, uh, four, maybe? Four, four, four. lanes of highway traffic. Four yeah. lanes, okay? I call it the canyon because yeah. you're surrounded by big concrete walls because mm -hmm. it goes a little bit down there. And, it, and they chained themselves these concrete barrels in the middle of the highway. 1,200-pound cement filled. Right, they blocked off the entire highway yeah. at rush hour in the morning in Boston and Medford and um, someplace else. Anyway, and on the I-93, which if you look at a map from a great distance, if you go to Google Maps, you can see I-93. It's a pretty big road. Yeah. And, uh, and Southeastern Expressway. And they... they they, they basically blocked emergency equipment. They blocked people from getting to appointments. They made people late for work. And uh, okay. one person on uh, Twitter called them douche barrels. Which is a perfect term for it. Yes. Howie Carr of the Herald and also the Howie Carr radio sh show network, because now he's off on his own, no longer WRKL. I noticed that, yes. And uh, he wrote a scathing column uh, about these... Uh, Nitwits. Nut jobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> douche barrels. Yeah. I liked, yeah, douche barrels. I like that. And, you know, he 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 basically quoted uh, Thomas Sowell. I don't have it in front of me, but basically uh, 
Um, you recall what uh, Dr. Thomas Sowell said about these folks. How come all these people get to do all this protesting? Excuse me. How do they support themselves? And oftentimes it's us. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. We, oh wait, we, which brought us to our other. Yes. You got Obama phone? Yes, everybody in Cleveland, low minority, got Obama phone. Play the music. He gave us a phone. Uh, I got to go find it. Get your I'm here trying to get some Obama bucks. That's what I'm doing, trying to get some Obama money. I don't have it. Do you really want to work, or you just you just want to get a free check? I just want to get a free check. My State little of the mortgage union. and, you know, paying my lights and free gas stuff. bill. Why are you here? To get some money. What kind of money? Obama money. Where's it coming from? Obama. And where did Obama get it? I don't know. Everybody in Cleveland, low minority, got Obama phone. So uh, his uh, the the great gifter. Yep. <laughs> and I put it up last night. The blog headline of the day: Not bread and circuses. Use crack instead. And the headline was Obama's State of the Union in five words. Hashtag. I'll give you free stuff. And in essence, he's proving Romney's uh, forty-seven percent remark to be true because you know he wants to give. Um, you know, the Obama phone, as you just played, more free Internet, more free health care, Medicaid. Now he wants free community college, free paid sick leave, free paid family leave. Um, it just goes on and on. The Democrats rolled out their plan last week about $2,000, and they're calling it a, a paycheck credit that they would give you on April 15th. They want to give you a higher amount for child care, which... You know, I'm always for giving people credit so that they get to keep more of their own money, but then they had to spoil it by saying, and we'll pay for this on putting a new tax on financial traction, on financial transactions from, that the super rich engage in. So, you know, once again, at least this time, Steve and Mike, yeah, they were clear about, we're going to give all this stuff to you because we're going to take it from somebody else. And my it's interesting comment, that they would presume that the, if they did that, that the rich people wouldn't transact someplace else. Which which they will. I mean, any time they try to overregulate uh, U.S. markets, the, uh, the the action goes overseas. When there was a big crackdown on the kind of, tr- of transactions involved in public offerings, more companies registered on London and Frankfurt stock exchanges. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. You can impoverish the United States by trying to regulate it out of existence, and I think that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, well, the latest stat is now, for the first time ever, the number of startups has fallen below the number of failing or shuttered businesses. You know, my dad was a uh, commercial fisherman uh, as I was growing up before he passed away. And uh, one of the things I do remember is, remember the luxury boat tax, the, the yacht tax, mm-hmm. which was supposed to shaft the rich buying their big boats, which they're not as big as they used to, as they are now. But, you know, it was their expensive boats. The ordinary person could not afford th- that kind of thing. So the, th- the thought was, we'll stick it to the, the, the rich people. Well, what ended up happening up and down here in the Northeast is a lot of the boatyards that used to service all these boats and sell these boats, they all had to sell out, and now they're just rich condos because they put people out of work, and they really hurt the ordinary guy, the little guy, the people who would haul the boats out using these humongous cranes, mm-hmm. the people who would do the scut work of scouring the hulls. Yeah. At that time, wooden boat. when I was small, wooden boats were still more the norm than the fiberglass ones or the steel ones. So you had to sand those suckers down, clean them up, take out the dry rot, put the, the, uh, the sea borer paint on, yeah. and then paint over it and do all kinds of stuff. It used to keep a lot of people busy, you know, the engines, you know, anything from a five horsepower um, little putt-putt motor on the back of a skiff to what my dad had, which was dual uh, Mercedes-Benz diesels Mm -hmm. uh, in his uh, Chris Craft, custom-built Chris Craft at the time. And all those people just went away, and they killed it. And this this is the same thing. You're absolutely right, Mike. They'll force this offline. Yeah, and I, I was actually uh, traveling regularly up and down the coast to Maine for vacation every year, and you could see oh, the, the boat yards are all struggling in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, when these taxes were enacted, and it took a long while for it to recover. And, and not only that, uh, the super-rich will still have their boats, but the moderately rich that would have stretched 
simply stopped. Yeah. Uh, and so the number of, of boats that will, were in demand fell dramatically. Now, that's a case of creating even more inequality, boat marine inequality. As you, I think I have, it's a great way to put it. The super rich still had their yachts, even bigger yachts, yeah. and those that could have afforded it, the federal government put a glass, well, should I say a marine layer, a yeah, marine uh, ceiling on yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it fits in, I, I said, Well, marine Steve, layer's foggy, which is, you know, exactly what uh, this kind of thinking is. Yeah. Well, I had put in a, a, a WTF, sub, uh, WTF submission as well. It came out of Britain. The, you know, a mom and her uh, adult daughter, between the two of them, weighed 43 stone. 602 pounds. They were too fat to do anything. They were paid a total of $60,000 a year. And they came right out and said, we'd rather be fat, happy, and not working than skinny, working, and depressed. So they automatically went, because I'm working, I will be depressed. I can't say that I blame them. If the government's willing to give you this money to do nothing with your life. I mean, these. I saw the pictures. These ladies were huge. And I saw what they ate. And they made no bones about it. They blamed it on their genetics. They wouldn't get up and exercise. They'd never go to a gym. They didn't try to improve themselves. They ate the junk food. And they were proud of it. And they said, we're not going to change. Why should we? We get all this money. I mean, this is the attitude that's going to destroy Western civilization. That I can be the ward of somebody else, that I no longer have to be responsible for myself. Yeah, and you know, it, this accelerated in the 1960s pretty much around the Western world, the, uh, the high-rise developments to basically rack and stack the, the poor that you were feeding the, the benefits to, uh, and they then subsequently destroyed those uh, high-rise developments and made them into uh, vertical ghettos. Uh, it, it happened everywhere. It happened in Britain, it happened here, it happened uh, uh, throughout Europe. It happened in France, and they stacked them with Muslims. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, I, I dryly note that, um, you know, this was supposed these high-rise projects were supposed to be la creme de la creme for the for the dealing with the masses, and yet what happened? They t they turned out five, six, ten years later to be nothing more than havens of gangs, drugs, and dismay and poverty. Right. Uh, very bad in crime, not a place to be. And they end, the central planners who thought they were just so cool, so smart people-ish, they ended up having to, t they're tearing them down still. That's, yeah. They turned out to be stupid. And yet the central planners with uh, the, the sustainable community initiatives, what do they want to do? They want to repeat it once again, rack us and stack us, even here in the rural so areas. Yeah, suck oh. everybody into small developments. I've been given the high sign. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, Max has joined us, and we're going to get into his segment right after this. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. <laughs> We are back. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter. We're back. We're back. Like a bad penny. Okay. This is Grok Talk. Thank you for tuning in. Live streamed at graniteGrok.com. So, we'd like to move into another segment that we want to do every month with uh, our good friend Max Abramson. Uh, we can call it whatever we want. Justice in New Hampshire. I don't know. We'll talk about some legislation because we didn't have Guy this week, but... Uh, we definitely want to talk about what you just brought up and uh, anything else you have. So, let's get going. What's great and exciting in the world of <clears throat> justice in the New Hampshire legislature? Well, the, uh, they're 
two House committees that deal with criminal justice issues, the Judiciary, of course, and the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. When you got kicked off of. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we don't mean to laugh at that you, was Matt. Before. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> the story behind that, is, of course, is right after I start co-sponsoring and sponsoring bills, of course, you know, I've just been put on this committee as a freshman, and, you know, obviously... The speaker's office gets gets a chance to look at everything that's being sponsored and co-sponsored, and uh, there there's a group of liberty reps who all kind of bundle together and support legislation to protect your rights and put dash cams and body cams and increased accountability and and uh, and the uh, the good old boy network doesn't like that very much, and so they start seeing that we kind of coalesce as a group and then they don't want us on any important committees. So they just move us all to child and family law or fish and game or, or some such thing. So, Not still, that those aren't important, but well, if, if you had to get rid of a committee. <laughs> well, I take child and family very seriously, having been a former daycare operator. Okay, we don't want to get into that, though. This is his segment. <laughs> I know, but it is an important committee. It is. They're all important. Anyway. Max has notes. So I... We haven't had any bill hearings in criminal justice yet, and the judiciary this week has only handled a couple of right-to-know bills, which are also very important issues but aren't criminal justice issues. So one that is coming up Thursday for hearing is defining probable cause or reasonable ground for the purpose of an arrest without a warrant. Uh, The Supreme Court has held that they don't have to have an arrest warrant to arrest you. All they have to have is the probable cause... Um, that uh, a police officer would present to a judge to get authorization for a, for an arrest warrant. So they they kind of bypass the the judge part and just allow cops to arrest people. So uh, that's how, how Judge Dredd got to be such a popular comic book. Yeah. How how did that come <laughs> bypassed about? Bypassed everything. What, what was what was the case on that? That was years and years ago. I th- that had to have been. What fifties or sixties or something? A very very long time ago, before my time, they've been arresting people without arrest warrants for a long time. Mm, it's true. Uh, I, was, I was going to say arrests without warrants appear to be common. I mean, I think to uh, to to come to your house and see stuff or seize you, they would need a warrant, uh, but they only need probable cause that a crime was or or is being committed to at least pick you up, right? Right. Well, there's a there's a little bit of background on this one. Uh, there's a, a difference between reasonable suspicion and probable cause. Reasonable suspicion means something that the officer can articulate to a reasonable person of ordinary intelligence that would lead one to believe that a, a crime may be occurring or may have occurred. Probable cause is different. It's, it's presumably a higher standard, and it is, again, something that the officer can articulate that shows that a crime has happened, is happening, or is about to happen, where the person who is being questioned and is being arrested uh, is the cause of the crime. So there has to be a known crime that would be committed or could have been committed, and it has to be the specific person that is being arrested. Now, the way that the police departments are bypassing that is they use something called protective custody, which is they just kind of detain people and... Um, they can either take you to the jail and detain you there, or they use under just reasonable suspicion. The lower standard, the lower standard, is that they will detain you, and the courts have said I think it's something like 30 minutes that they can just hold you and detain you and question you under reasonable suspicion, and look for look for anything that's obvious that's out in the open that they that they can detect with their five senses. Um, so that's been the standard. Um, the problem is that there are so many false accusations, and the, the the police themselves and firefighters are saying that these, you know, false accusations are, are so common and so rampant in our society that it, that that uh, it's it's wasting their time. And um, there's a there's a, a statute that allows towns to create a false alarm ordinance. Um, it's meant for alarm systems that just keep going off over and over again, mm-hmm. but. You can a town can also charge enact an ordinance where they can charge people if they keep calling the police ten, twenty, thirty times a month, and a disproportionate number of the calls come from a very small number of people who complain about the dog 
doing their business in the grass or that people get into these neighborhood neighbor disputes and they're complaining about zoning or they're complaining about the grass is is 12 inches high and they, they're out there with a ruler and everything is measuring the grass saying hey you're violating some obscure rule so um that's a problem but the false accusation uh, issue is also a big problem so i'm a co-sponsor in hb 207 which would require that either the police officer have first-hand knowledge or that another peace officer has first-hand knowledge and has referred it to the arresting officer or that they have a statement from at least two witnesses not just one and that allows you to kind of cover your bases but you're not going to arrest someone just on a false accusation is there any support from police for this sir uh i'm Almost 100% certain that Callahan will be in there arguing against it, and he'll come up with some case from Pennsylvania in 1979 where they wanted to arrest someone but didn't, and then they went out and blew up a whole bus of 14-year-old honors <laughs> cheerleaders somewhere. I mean, they, <laughs> the, the, he fits in well here, doesn't the he? <laughs> yeah. Arguments that are made for authoritarianism and arbitrary power and for big government are always. You know, they're really poor. And they're always one very tenuous example that there's no great uh, statistical evidence for. It's, it's an isolated case in an isolated place. And it's like, just because this happened once, we have to be able to arrest people everywhere, anytime. Exactly. And we, we've we seen this in committee hearings, not just in criminal justice. I saw it in science and technology with the... Uh, HB 103, which was <laughs> oh, widely laughed Oh, my favorite bill so far. If your what car's ha- what traveling. Ha- what happened to that bill? It, it was discussed this past Wednesday, and there's nothing on the website that says what the vote was. It was laughed at committee. There was a question offered by the chair, an overweight, portly, but nice representative um, who was appointed chair after Jasper, so I won't say anything. <laughs> After Jasper was elected speaker, people who supported him got many, many of the chair and vice chair and rules committee assignments. Mm-hmm. Um, but he kind of polled, which they're allowed to do. He informally polled members, and they asked who wants to retain it and who wants to ITL it. Um, there were only three or four members who voted to retain it. The rest said ITL. So that was as most likely to be killed and maybe not come back again oh, ever good. unless there's a pretty substantial change in technology yeah i was going to re- ridicule mr belanger over that one if it went forward yeah this is the bill <laughs> that i should ridicule him for even trying well i have already he's twice. been ridiculed uh, we've ridiculed him for not telling his constituent who suggested that he introduced this legislation lots of air quotes uh that you need to say you know what <laughs> There's limitations. This isn't realistic. It can't be done. Um, let's wait. Yeah. And for our listeners who haven't read Granite Rock, this is talking about Representative Belanger, who put forward a bill that would say once a vehicle went beyond five miles an hour, all cell phones in the car would shut down. Now, you could be on a boat. You could be just a passenger. You could be running. You could be biking. You could be whatever. At five miles an hour. And the, the thing here is, once again, we see the progressive mantra of, for the sin of a few, the many are punished. Sure, the driver shouldn't be texting and all that other stuff. That's not the problem. But to punish everybody else in the car who might want to or watch a TV show or a movie or whatever, um, okay. why? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, what uh, else uh, is going? We uh, want to keep going on justice. Yeah, and what about the navigation components of said uh, cell phone device? What about what? the navigation components in the car? Yeah. They'd be useless. Anyway. <laughs> so, well, the bill just said texting an email. Yeah, but it would didn't be shut really, off. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. and it's all only wireless it's... devices, though. What about you know the cars that can talk the you know speak out the text, or you could speak and then it would translate it to text. I mean, unintended consequences. Anyway, so what else is coming up? Uh... Um, another one is HB two fourteen, which I think is also a um, taskers bill which is revocation of a police officer's certification. If there's clear and convincing evidence that a police officer has, in the course of their official duties, committed any act that would constitute perjury, false statement, or tampering with or fabricating physical evidence. Now, with the widespread adoption of cell phone cameras, with more and more dash cameras, by the way, Seabrook Police Department finally has 
started to install dash cameras in the police cruisers after 15 years of people fighting this in Seabrook. They're finally installing them. Um, and also represented Technical Caster. difficulties are anticipated. Yes. Well, <laughs> they are the type that the officer gets to turn on or off or turn on with the blue lights. So if they want to beat the crap out of someone, they turn the blue lights off, do their business, and then turn the camera back on. For listeners who aren't familiar, Seabrook may be one of the dirtiest police departments and where? not in the state. Oh, Seabrook's worse. Yeah. Okay, but worse. where's where where would come second? Where's bad, but Seabrook is worse. Yeah. So anyway, that's a good. Okay. Yeah. How 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 was that faring? Uh, the police department. Well, the the police chief who is in there now, Lee Batomsky, is said to be trying to clean up the department, and the police department has voted twice for a no confidence vote and has fallen just short of asking the selectmen to remove him. And, Who could have saw that coming? Well, Tomsky isn't the first police chief to try to clean up that department, and he isn't the first police chief to be forced out. So there are some people saying, you know, just fire all of them. Yeah. You know, if <laughs> start if, over. The, the the big news story in Seabrook right now is that officer, Officer Laurent from the Bergeron beating mm-hmm. case, where they slam the kid's head in the wall in the police station, and they pepper spray him. While he's down, and then look up at the camera smiling. That officer is smiling with that Cheshire cat grin. He's uh, He was fired, of course. He is not charged with any crime because the grand jury threw out the, you know, simple assault, felony assault. It's actually felony assault, I believe, if you pepper like spray someone. a minute left. Oh, sorry. That's okay. So he's suing the town, or he's, he's in arbitration to try to sue the town to get his job back or at least get his pay back. I hope there's a well-funded lawsuit against him for the civil assault. So the the final one that I've reviewed lately is relative to removal or impoundment of a vehicle. It's HB 282, and it's sponsored by the chair and vice chair of that committee, uh, Representatives Thole and Welch. And that would – currently they can – if you're arrested or incapacitated, they can remove your vehicle, impound it. They can tow it at very, very high cost and at your risk, and they're usually damaged. Uh, um, towed by cronies who are kicking back some of the money. Correct. Um, and that actually happened in my case, $100 for an in, in-town tow plus extra fees. Um, however, if the, if the fees mount faster than you, they wanted, than you can pay it off, you right. lose the car. They want to delete the part that says if the vehicle is a menace to traffic so they can just impound it and tow it and charge you. All right. Thanks, Max. we got to take a break. We'll be back with Dr. Jason Fodeman, MD, and this is Rock Talk. Stay tuned. whether she still supports Obamacare. Senator Jean Shaheen said, Yes, I do continue to support the law. We're beginning to see some positive results. How can Senator Shaheen say we're seeing positive results when 22,000 of our neighbors have already lost their health insurance? What's worse, the Boston Globe reports the state's only health insurance provider radically reduced the number of hospitals in their network, forcing some people to drive over an hour for lab work, even when there's a hospital within a few miles of their home. When pressed about lack of access, Shaheen said, There are some hospitals that are not covered, unfortunately, and um, I I certainly hope that's going to change. Jean Shaheen promised us we could keep our doctors and our health care coverage. Now she hopes we can get to a local hospital? Call Senator Shaheen at 603-647-7500. Tell her we need more than hope. We need leadership. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. The Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is the repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org.
Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. You're listening to Grok Talk.